everyone, and welcome to another episode of Fossil Friday Web Chats hosted by the Western Science Center and the Raymond M. Alf Museum. Again, I am Brittany Stoneberg. I'm the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the Western Science Center. We also have Gabe Santos. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, AKA Dr. Alan Grant. He is the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the Raymond M. Alf Museum, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today um, from the show PBS Eons. Um, Blake uh, and Callie, thank you guys for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's really exciting. I've never done a fossil fighting before. <laughs> <laughs> we're so excited to have you guys here. Uh, we're obviously we know you guys, but we've always been big fans, and we're just really excited to learn all about the origin of eons and kind of talk with some of our personal psychom heroes. Oh, well, thanks. Well, we're really excited to be here to talk about eons. It's like one of my favorite things too. So. Yeah. We could talk about it all day. Right. <laughs> yes, I think this will be a great opportunity to really show off how you can communicate paleontology um, and talk to people about the science of it. Awesome. So um, if you guys are not familiar with Blake and Callie, you definitely will be by the end of this. First, we have Blake DePestino. Blake is a science journalist who worked for National Geographic before coming on board to report, write, and edit for SciShow and Crash Course. He's also the creator of Western Digs, a science news site that covers archaeology and paleontology in the American West. <laughs> right. And Callie, uh, Callie Moore, besides being a host on Eons, Callie is the collections manager of the University of Montana Paleontology Center. At the UMPC, she is basically a fossil librarian, keeping the fossil collection <laughs> organized and accessible, as well as giving tours and supervising volunteers. Awesome. Well, Thank you guys again for being here. And as always, everybody, while you're watching, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we will address those after the presentation. So Kelly and Blake, whenever you are ready, take it away. All right, let's see. I am the screen sharing person. So let's get this going here. All right, so we are going to talk about the origin of eons today and give you a whole <laughs> background about um, how the show started, how we make episodes, and then a few highlights uh, from our episodes and things like that. So this is just for you, Gabe. I made this just for you. <laughs> 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 so uh, not so very long time ago in a state far, far away, Blake, take it away. You got like the font down and the color of the font and everything. I'm, I take, <laughs> I'm, I'm really impressed. <laughs> That's dedication. Uh, the origin of Eons probably began in, let me think, we debuted in June mm -hmm. of 2015 at VidCon, which is, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, 2017. Mm -hmm. um, at VidCon, which is like a convention of, at the time it was YouTubers and now it's TikTokers, Instagrammers and whatever else. Uh, in the stadium at the Anaheim Convention Center, uh, like 5,000 people, Hank Green, who's our executive producer, uh, and Callie and I went on stage and sort of announced that this show was going to launch. I, I was so like stage struck, I literally don't remember what I said, but apparently a video of it and it went fine. Did go um, it was great. Something yeah. told me that my dress was pretty, so that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that night was a culmination of probably two years of conversations with PBS Digital Studios, uh, with whom we produce Eons. And so uh, Kelly and I work for a production company called Complexly that produces SciShow, Crash Course, and now Eons, uh, Origin of Everything, which is a social history channel. Um, we produce content for YouTube, educational content. And in 2015, uh, PBS came to us and said, uh, what do you think about doing a show about dinosaurs? And I was like, cool. Um, it's kind of hard to talk about one organism without any context though. Like if you're gonna talk about or uh, dinosaurs, you gotta talk about where they came from and then like their living descendants and then why all the changes happened vis-a-vis -vis changes in climate and other ecosystem changes, uh, geologic time. And so like, as I started talking them through it, I basically said, sure, I'll see you that and I'll raise you a show about the history of life on earth. Because if you don't want to talk about anything, you really have to talk about everything taken whole. All and of they were it. Like, yeah, and they were like, whoa. Um, 
the never ending show topic all of yeah. life on earth <laughs> which is why that one conversation unspooled into like two years of figuring out what a show like that would look like uh and so i drafted some pitches of like what specific episodes would look like uh we put together some potential like writing talent and stuff uh and callie was already a known quantity because she and i don't know if you want to talk about this callie uh but because she is a local paleontologist she had been on uh SciShow talk show yeah uh, which was a, a feature that we had i think monthly where we had local scientists come on and hank would interview them about their work i don't know right. if you want to talk about that kelly but sure sure um so i was actually giving uh outreach uh activity at the local children's museum and one of the producers of SciShow happened to come in while i was doing that and she was like hey that was pretty fun do you want to come talk to Hank Green about what you do on SciShow Talk Show and I was like sure and it went really well and afterwards um they brought me in to the fold and was like hey we're trying to do this natural history show it's going to be super cool and they were like would you want to host it or be a host and I was like uh sure and they're like okay well let's have you come in for a screen test so I came in for a screen test and first time I ever read off a teleprompter and they're like no that was actually really good let's have you come back um and do another one with like an entire room full of people giving you directions and I was like great <laughs> <laughs> and uh, undoubtedly it went really well and so they were like okay yeah you're totally in line to be a host on this show and then it was basically radio silence for a year I didn't hear like anything, maybe like a one little email every three months or something from Blake being like, it's still in the process. We're still working. And then all of a sudden, like, I think it was like sometime in March of 2017, I got yeah. the email that was like, we have funding. It's a go. We need to film, 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 film. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And then it was just like, it's been that way ever since. And so. we, yeah, we started shooting in March mm -hmm. and I was, I'm the chief content officer for Complexly. And so I didn't really have a role in this other than creating the content. And uh, the programming director of PBS Digital Studios at the time knew about my blog, which is Western Digs, westerndigs.org, which I have not, since the show started, I didn't have the time to start doing it. But now because of the apocalypse, I'm just sort of, I'm just blogging all the time. So <laughs> I'm, I'm creating new content for it now. Um, or my first post in three years last week. Um, and she said, I'm, I know that you blog about this stuff. Do you want to co-host the show? And I'm like, I'm not a scientist and like, you've met me, do you still, do you want this? <laughs> Is this what you want, like, you know, on YouTube? And she's like, yeah, we'll forget it. We'll fix it in post. And um, <laughs> so it wound up with Callie and uh, Hank and I uh, being the hosts. And then we launched with that. And we had like maybe three episodes filmed under our belt by the time we walked on stage in June of 2017. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. Um right there let's do this slide um so yeah so we launched in 2017 at vidcon like blake said and then on youtube a little later so people at vidcon got a preview of our show um and as of yesterday we've had 124 episodes post um 1.31 million subscribers and Amazing. 160 million views on the page uh we launched a facebook watch account in 2018 and we now have 133,000 followers over there um so again this is a, a collaboration between pbs digital studios and complexly the production company here in town let's see um but for scicom uh, we really try to balance this accessibility and science literacy. So Blake, how about you take this one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, science is hard. And uh, my background is as a science communicator. I used to work for not the magazine, but National Geographic News, which is their daily online news service. I was one of their first, it was the first journalist actually that they hired. They had web developers just kind of like blogging about science. Uh, and we started like posting articles every day where we would interview uh, experts about their latest research and it was all peer reviewed research. And then we would talk to out people who were not involved in research to sort of vet it for us. Um, and through that, I learned how to distill information for a popular audience. And a lot of that, even then it was like still journalism, but what Eons does is like, it adds the basic uh, kind of translation of like the psychom that you see out there, but it's much more narratively driven. And so we usually, we wanted to, we knew we wanted to go in with something that would appeal to people who didn't even know that they were interested in paleontology. So it wasn't 
just aimed at dinosaur nerds. It was aimed at people who like just thought Earth was an interesting place. And maybe they had heard of Demetrodon or Quetzalcoatl, and you know we would couch it in such a way that they would actually watch that episode, as opposed to like sort of nerding out over uh, like details that only experienced people would understand. Uh, so we wanted something that was really narratively based and like with an arc that would take off and land. We set the scene in the beginning of whatever the organism is, or maybe it's another organism, you know. And we don't anthropomorphize, of course, but you know, we allow ourselves to um, express sympathy for like the trilobites that nature tried to kill about three or four times before it finally succeeded. Um, I feel bad for them. I wish I could have one. <laughs> uh, they're through two major mass extinctions only to get wiped out yeah, by the biggest but, one and, ever, you know, so. Good for them, right. for trying. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and there are you know, like narratives where, yeah, you know, there are underdogs or heroes and villains. Uh, and there, we always establish a context for why things happen, which is why the story became about life instead of just about dinosaurs, you know. Um, and it's proven successful because we have managed to use storytelling as a tool to communicate uh, the science of paleontology. And also we all, uh, take pains to whenever we can depict actual paleontological pursuit, the endeavor itself of, you know, how paleontologists read the land, you know, which Callie is excellent at. Um, we still want to do a thing where she, there was a site that she was working here in Western Montana and like she was going to take me out there and she would, she would translate for me how she reads the land because I see hills and she sees an Eocene lake, you know, I'm like, where is there a lake? And she pointed <laughs> it out to me. I'm like, oh my God, it makes sense. <laughs> We'll get out there. We'll get yeah. out there. Like. And like how fossils are prepared, how they're excavated, um, and what's the difference between like morphology and taphonomy, things like that. And we do it all in the in the confines of uh, storytelling so that people secretly learn things when they're actually just having fun. Mm -hmm. That's what we like to do. We like to sneak our vegetables in with... Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, you good there, Blake? Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, I just saw the the slide about the live stream that you did at the Smithsonian last summer. That was amazing. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. That, that was, was a whole thing. That was a whole thing. Yep. So um, you can still watch it. It's up on the Smithsonian Channel's uh, Facebook page. Uh, so if you go and scroll through their videos, you can check out the sweet live stream that we did. Um, and it was a week after the new Deep Time Hall opened at the Smithsonian. And I don't know if I've ever been happier in my life. I mean, my wedding day was pretty good, but like, wow, <laughs> getting to just be in there like with a small film crew and Blake and a couple of the Smithsonian people, but I basically had the entire exhibit to myself. I was literally skipping through the aisles. It was, <laughs> it was, it was a really good day. And it was a little stressful, but it was a really good day. So. And we filmed, I was just amazed by how much like they were just excited to have us there and we were so we were thrilled to be there. And they also let us shoot in the deep time hall after hours. And we, Callie and I shot an episode about how evolution works and how we figured yep. it out, which we'll is on our, to, on our channel. Yep, we'll get to that one too. So um, I just want to throw up some milestones from us. So uh, what happened to the world's greatest ape was our first episode that reached uh, a million views and that happened in our first season. So it probably, happened maybe five or six months after the channel launched. So that was kind of a big surprise for all of us. Uh, we reached a million subscribers in November of 2019. And this Megalon, Megalodon video is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> it was the first to reach 10 million views. It took about a year to get 10 million views, but um, it consistently is in one of our top 10 videos every single month. It's kind of throwing off our algorithm right now, but yeah. Um, but we love it and we're glad that everybody else also loves it. Um, but yeah, that was the first one. I think that's our only video that it's reached 10 million, but I think so. Uh, yeah, but it's a great one. So if you haven't watched it, go and check it out. <laughs> Um, so eons is made with an entire army of people. So, uh, here is our end screen with all of our credits. So you can see how many people are a part of this process. And we also give a shout out to our patrons at the $35 level. So if you want to get your name in our, uh, credits, you can go to patreon.com slash eons and check us out, become an eonite. Um, but yeah, so like, like I said, there's a bunch of people that make 
eons happen. Um, anything to add, Blake? Uh, no, we're going to talk about the sort of creative process in a bit, right? Like where, yes. the, where the ideas come That's from. That's right. We all. Oh, so. dope. <laughs> Go ahead, Blake. Uh, eons is the only show that I actually edit at the script level, like where my hands are in the scripts. And when it comes to SciShow and Crash Course and other complexity projects, I used to do that all myself, but the company's gotten so big that we now have a staff of people that just does Crash Course and just does SciShow. And I work with them to make that happen. But Eons is the only thing that I work with directly. And I work with it uh, with Dr. Darcy Shapiro, who's a physical anthropologist, who started as a freelance writer for Eons. And she pioneered our coverage of human evolution. Yeah. And uh, I managed to hire her on full time <laughs> to help uh, generate and edit content for Eons. And it's She's so good at so many things, it's amazing. She used to um, lecture at Rutgers University and uh, now she just works for us. But she, she, like, she's responsible for all of the idea generation and the kind of the development of the scripts. So I'd say like maybe 25% of the content that we produce these days are things that like Callie or Darcy or I think up. Hank every now and then has an idea. Um, and the rest are pitched to us from freelance writers. And we have, Darcy would know for sure, I would say at least a dozen freelance writers yeah, probably. Uh, who work with us sort of on a, on a script by script basis. And they are all um, either working paleontologists or geologists or people who have degrees in you know, biology, geology, or you know, at least sort of like a master's degree in some kind of paleo field. So they know what they're talking about. And they also know what is interesting. Like they know more, they know way more than I do. And so they can pitch me on things that I have not heard of. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, they come up with most of the ideas. And we try to find people who are, um, who work in different parts of geologic time, you know, so that we have like an Eocene mammal person. And then we have a sort of like um, Ediacaran uh, Cambrian kind of person. Uh, and then we have geologists, zoologists, um, biologists. We have people who just like sort of work with us to uh, talk about how the how certain structures have evolved, like where blood comes from, where the human heart comes from, where mm -hmm. eyes vertebrate eyes come from is something we're working on. And they, you know, a lot of that discussion happens at the molecular level. And we have people who could talk about molecular genetics. Um, so we're very lucky. It takes a long time to find people who have that combination of alleles that's like, they really know the science and they know how to talk to people. They know how to tell stories. And we're very lucky to, to have them. And we work with them to like find the narrative in the story that they want to tell. If they want to tell the story of like where vertebrate eyes come from, you know, um, we might begin with say the first organism in the fossil record uh, that had eyes that we, could, that we could describe as eyes. And we sort of describe that thing in the environment that it lived in. And then we kind of zoom out to figure out, well, how did that thing get there? Uh, and then the rest of the episode is sort of like tracing back the steps to how that organism existed. And then when you see it again at the end, the, the picture is complete. You know, it makes more sense. Right. Uh, and then it goes to uh, Callie. Oh, there's that, yeah, <laughs> there's the, the, the graph. And Darcy actually has a whole, she has like a dozen different kind of graphs of how, what the shapes narratives can take. Oh, yeah. This <laughs> yeah. is just a general like story narrative I pulled off of Google Images. <laughs> she has a whole library of like different kind of twists and turns. Sometimes they're like a detective story and, you know, there's like a geologic formation that, that paleontologists geologists can't figure out. And it's all, this, the story is all about how the scientists try to figure it out. And, and they, you, have, you have the big reveal, the discovery. Um, and sometimes she talks about scripts in terms of <laughs> uh, Hollywood. She's like very media savvy. And she's like, I feel like this is more of a Tarantino script than a Billy Wilder <laughs> script, if you know what I mean. I'm like, I don't know what you mean, but I'm like, <laughs> it all comes out fine in the end. Uh, and since she uh, herself is a PhD and our writers are also experienced scientists, uh, we know that the content is robust, but uh, nothing gets into the studio before it gets the mark of approval from Callie, who is our fact checker. And she fact checks not just the scripts, but also all of the images that we use. Yep. So um, when I get the script, it's usually about 80, 90% complete. They might be still tweaking some lines here and there, but the factual bits and pieces of the script are 
done. Um, so I basically go line by line of every single script and try to independently co uh, corroborate what the writer is saying. Um, most of the time, I don't have any huge issues. Every once in a while, there can be some bigger issues uh, with a script. But for the most part, when it comes to me, it's usually pretty factually good. Our scripts can be pretty heavy with material. Um, and so there can be a lot of moving parts in a single script. And so it's really important that we have all of the numbers correct uh, from the publications or we represent two sides of an argument. You know, mm -hmm. um, we got in trouble in our early days by just you know, this is probably the most well-known hypothesis and everybody uses this hypothesis. So we're just going to talk about this hypothesis. But there's this other smaller hypothesis that we ignored and our commenters yeah. are brilliant people and they catch everything. And so we got called out a few times for not um, representing all sides of the argument or all sides of the hypothesis. So um, nowadays we do, we try really, really hard to at least add a sentence that Oh, and there is this other theory out there. Yeah. So, um, we get all sides represented. And um, yeah, so like I said, I um, all the writers have a reference list at the end, and I usually ignore it unless I can't find. Oh, I didn't know that. Information. <laughs> That's interesting. And so if yeah. you watch an episode in the description, you'll see um, all the sources that we use for that episode. And so we're transparent about where our information comes from. The mm -hmm. vast majority of it is peer reviewed research. Sometimes it's oh, yeah. like paywall or whatever, which sucks, but we're just trying to be transparent about like yep. why we're saying what we're saying. And mm -hmm. correct me uh, if I'm wrong, Callie, but I feel like most of the, when you find problems in a script, it usually is because where we'll characterize um, say like the conventional thinking about where eyes come from. And then right. you'll find a paper that says, well, actually I couldn't find any, I mean, like I found that paper, but I also found a paper that says it went through this mechanism, this yep. tree, this different kind of part of the evolutionary tree. And so we have to pause and sort of figure out how do we incorporate that? We don't want to talk about things as being like facts because we sort of want to provide the context of things being hypotheses and right. well, hypotheses are based on data. So what's the data, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, we, our company is called Complexly because we take pride in allowing complex matters to be complex, yeah. but it takes a lot of time to like parse out all the information so that people understand like, here's why we don't know. Here's why we, what we, we know what we don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> here's what we don't know. Here's yep. why we have the, a, a lack of clarity or at least a lack of agreement, you know, and we give people the conflicting data or like, well, like we did an episode about the evolution of snakes and that was one where Ooh, we yeah. found out there's a whole school of thought like during the editing process that wasn't in the original draft of the script and right. so the script is kind of like we don't know where snakes came from they could have been terrestrial they could have been marine you know yeah. choose your and own I, adventure <laughs> i think that that was one thing blake that you probably had to kind of come to terms with is a lot of the stuff that we present does not have a cut and dry answer at the right. end like it's not a perfect little bow at the end it's a yeah. at the yeah. end and so I think that that was kind of a tough one for us to be able to put it into our narrative. You know, you want to start a middle and an end and you want a clean ending, but a lot of the stuff that we present does not have a clean ending. There's not a straight up answer to any of these questions that we have. And so that's also been kind of um, a challenge to work it into where we give you all this, epi uh, all this information, but at the end of the episode, we say, Whoop, and yeah. And, and, it, and it's okay, and that's okay, because that's paleontology. Yeah. You know, we can only know what we can gain from the rocks and the bones, and sometimes the information that we need right now is not available with our current techniques and processes. So it's been- The challenge for Darcy and me, especially, is like when that comes up, say in the case of snakes, um, we, like you can't tie it up in a bow because there is no consensus nope. or there's not a lot of clarity, mm -hmm. but we can still, uh, create an episode that's satisfying for the viewer you yeah. know and the satisfaction can come from somewhere else like maybe it's just in the fascination of like wow we've been studying snakes for hundreds of years and we still are not totally sure about their origins right um, like that in itself is could be kind of satisfying because it's about what we like at least we know what we don't know <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly yeah. exactly 
All right, so that's how an episode is developed, and this is how we make an episode. So uh, we film here in Missoula in the basement of the Complexly building that actually used to be a funeral home, so that's fun. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nick Jenkins is our director, and it takes anywhere from one to two hours to film an episode. So yeah, our episodes are usually around 10 minutes long, and it literally takes us sometimes almost two hours to film them, depending on how hard the names are to say in the script. <laughs> yep. Because um, that is- Parenthropus Boisei. That's what oh, I started my... with recently. Yeah. God. No. Um, <laughs> the birds with teeth episode, I think. For me. Uh, I oh, almost boy. thought I was going to give up. I was going to give it. up. I got <laughs> yelled at after that. That shoot. Yeah. <laughs> Less names. Yeah. So we film it here and we film vertically. And I'll get into why we film vertically in a little bit. And we also film in 4K, which when I heard about filming in 4K, it was a little intimidating. I was like, I don't think I'm ready for that kind of close up. And everybody was like, oh, no, 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 don't worry. Um, it's just so we can zoom in and out and still keep high resolution, but we um, put everything out in HD. So don't worry. And I was like, oh, okay, that's better. Then we send like the raw footage in 4K is sometimes around 40 gigs worth of information. And we send that to our other Complexly office in, in, in Indianapolis, Indiana, lots of ends in there. Um, and Seth Radley and Mark Olson make the videos pretty. So oh they do all of that work. Um, and Seth said it takes about seven to, den seven to 10 days to make an episode. So that's pretty good. So we shoot it, we send it to Indy, take seven to 10 days. Seth uses APM music um, to score the background track. So if you've ever wondered um, where the background music comes from, there, so that's where it is. And then the other Callie, Callie Dishman, uh, is our sound designer. So we picked her up a couple of months ago. And I don't know if you guys noticed this, but maybe after I say it, you'll notice it more. We have a lot more depth to the sounds in our episodes now. So if we show a scene out um, in the forest, you'll hear leaves rustling and birds chirping in the background. And it's given a whole new dimension um, of sound quality to our episodes. So be sure to listen for those little things. And that's all Callie. She's, we got two great Callies on the team now. <laughs> it also is the first, you know, is the first show that we produced at least in the Montana studio that has music in oh, the background. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it really like, and that decision was made by Seth because he recognized the the narrative quality in the show, and he wanted to reinforce like the mood with music. Yeah, Seth is Seth does uh, probably most of the the production part, putting the episode together, and then Mark usually does a lot of the animations and some of the other little graphics that you might see in an episode. And I tell Seth at least I try to every four or six weeks, like what you do is magic. It's amazing yep. how his work like completely transforms the content that I that Darcy and I give him. I because, know. Like the example is like this week's script about uh, it's about how erosion events from the Andes Mountains caused a mass death of whales. I think in the Miocene. I can't remember. Yeah. And um, there are a lot of moving parts and like a lot of geochemistries. Like one thing caused another, caused another, and boom, you have dead whales. And once I saw the proof of the video, I'm like, oh, now I get it. I don't yeah. know, I understand that much better after I see the graphics to help analyze or interpret the information for people than when I was reading the script. Yeah, it, a lot of times the it really comes together. And sometimes I'll, I'll sign off on an episode and it'll be sent to Seth and I'm just like, man, how is he even gonna do this? <laughs> the draft I'm like oh it's perfect it's perfect I didn't even know what perfect was and you found it <laughs> yeah he's great um all right so that's how an episode is made from filming to um production to sound and then once uh, a draft episode is ready I check again I check all the images in the episode to make sure that what we're showing is what we're talking about and um, then we send it to PBS to make sure we get the final approval from them and then it's uploaded to YouTube. So we've been uploading on Tuesdays and sometimes Wednesdays and here in our third season, although we really don't talk in, in seasons around here, but um, we'll be uploading three times a month instead of four times a month. So that's going to allow us to do 
cooler stuff in our videos and take a little bit of pressure off of Seth um, so he has a little bit more time with each episode. And mm -hmm. um, so we'll do three times a month. That's starting. with the, uh, yeah, with the, uh, like as a courtesy from PBS, yeah. because they recognized how much time goes into content development and, but especially post-production for each episode. Eons is a beast. <laughs> yeah. It is a beast. All right. So some episode highlights. I just want to throw these out here in case you aren't, um, <laughs> Um, you don't know about <laughs> about Eon. So I mentioned that we shoot vertically. And the reason why we do that is so we can use the host as a scale bar, which the very first meeting we had about this, where I was brought into a meeting about Eons, I was like, wouldn't it be cool if we could use us as scale bars? And Nick looks at me and he was like, duh, that's the reason why we're shooting vertically. And I was just like, <laughs> I was just this is the coolest thing ever. I've always wanted to be a scale bar. It's just, oh, I just love it. So here yeah. I am with Kessel Coatlas, and there is Blake with Titanoboa, and then there's Hank with a whole bunch of sauropods. And so I think- My favorite that, is you with the um, giant penguins. I'm like, Damn, Oh yeah, so that was really good. I got used as a scale bar a lot in that. <laughs> that penguin would mess you up. They would mess me up. I would not <laughs> wanna, mm, No, I don't wanna come face to face with a giant penguin. <laughs> Um, but we were also able to do, I think this was in our first season, it might have been the second season, uh, we were able to do a field trip episode where we went on the road to the Museum of the Rockies to talk to two of the professionals. Um, so we talked to Ellen Therese Lamb in the paleohistology lab at MOR, and then we also talked to Amy Atwater, um, their collections manager. And so that was such a fun day. It was a lot. It was very a lot, and it was in February in Bozeman. So if you see <laughs> that episode <laughs> is cold. Um, but those were really fun and we hope to do more of those types of field trip episodes, you know, once we can all leave our homes and stuff again and be in small spaces with one another. But um, those two episodes are very wonderful and I encourage you to check out both of them if you haven't seen them already. Anything to add, Blake? Um, no, I would love to do that again. Yes, we gotta yeah. do that again. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, we've also done a fun, lots of fun collaborations. So we always try to bring in oh. other channels. And um, so here's me and Blake at the Smithsonian. So he mentioned earlier that we collaborated on an episode with them. And so how evolution works and how we figured it out. It's the only episode, I believe, with all three hosts in it. So, mm -hmm. And again, me and Blake got to film in the Deep Time Hall exhibit before it was even opened. So you'll yeah. notice, um, especially behind me, that is the big nation T-Rex eating hatcher that you can't see on my t-shirt right now, but the Triceratops. And if you look closely, there's no glare from our lights. And the reason why is none of the big glass pieces were installed yet. There are no so, barriers between us and the, and the there was There was no yeah. barriers. You better believe I was all up there <laughs> <in> that display. <laughs> taking pictures because that's the only chance I mean the glass is there now so you can't you can't get that and so the episode itself turned out extremely beautiful because there's no glare there's hardly any glare in any of our shots uh from that episode so that's a really cool episode um we did this massive um three-way like trifecta episode with Origin of Everything in Space Time. If you haven't watched those together, I highly encourage you to, to watch those. Um, I would start with Space Time um, and then go to It's Okay to Be Smart. And it's Okay to Be Smart, yeah. Smart. Yeah, and then watch our episode last. I think that that would be the way to watch them. But it's absolutely incredible. Um, and we shot all of our bits and pieces together. We were all in New York. Oh right? yeah, that's right. Yeah. We were all in New York together, and so we used um, a YouTube space in New York, and we all filmed our individual parts all at the same time. It was it was really neat. Um, it was how amazing how it came together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then the three at the bottom are our most recent collaborations. We did one with SciShow about how seven thousand years of epic floods changed the world, and so those are about the Missoula. Um, Missoula floods. Ooh. The Missoula floods. Yes. 
And then with Tirzu, my male mammoths lost the game, which is actually one of our really, really popular episodes. Tirzu is a huge YouTube channel as well. And then were these monsters inspired by fossils with Monstrum? And that was probably one of my favorite collabs because both me and the host of Monstrum were wearing dinosaur shirts. So that's a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. Um, I think, yep, that's it from us. So thank you guys for watching and being here with us today too. So I think we're going to take some questions now. So let me stop. <laughs> All right. We're back. Back to Sam. Almost. Come on. There we go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yes, now we can see and hear each other. All right. You back? We good? We're good. All right. Thank you so much, guys, for that presentation. Um, I'm, I, I've known you guys for a while. I'm pretty familiar with eons, but I love seeing the process behind it. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, a lot of YouTube videos, I don't think people understand all the production that goes on behind it. Yeah, that's a lot. It's a lot. I, I know uh, smaller channels probably, you know, it's just one person in front of a camera on their computer and they do all the editing themselves, you know, so we are definitely, we have a huge advantage that we get to, this is done by Complexly and PBS and we have this huge team of people that um, make this episode these episodes so beautiful. So if you're at home making YouTube videos and they don't look like eons, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> you don't have a big company working behind you and like nine different people making an episode what it is. And so keep on doing what you're doing um, and don't get discouraged because like I said, we have a huge team of people that make eons, so. Yeah, I think, I think my favorite part was the point you guys made about how paleontology doesn't really have an, an end, an ending, mm -hmm. when we think about it in a narrative fashion. Mm -hmm. um, science, we're always learning more about science, we're always discovering new things, and you can write a paper about a particular specimen, and then five to 10 years to 20 to a century later, somebody can find something new about that specimen and write it up. And so I liked hearing about how you guys handle that, you know, from a story standpoint, because usually stories have conclusions, and that's right. very, very often with Mm -hmm. Yep. And just, I mean, what was it? We, um, we did a Spinosaurus episode last season and then boom, <laughs> the swimmer <laughs> yesterday or whatever. And so um, basically our kind of motto is if you want some kind of new science to come out, have us make an episode on it. And within a month, a new paper yeah. is going to come out. <laughs> it like, completely blows holes in our whole episode. <laughs> at least half a dozen times a year. We'll do yep. an episode and then like within a month a paper will come out it doesn't necessarily like refute it or whatever but it's like you know, because usually most episodes are i think the last one before that was about snowball earth and did right. snowball earth happen before or after was it uh the end or division or i can't no, 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 no. Wait. uh that would have been in the uh pre-cambrian so yeah. uh snowball earth did it did the great unconformity cause oh, great snowball unconformity. Earth? right snowball earth caused yep. the great and I think it was the week after we did that episode, like another team weighed in on like one side of that debate. And like, we don't have to change anything. Spinosaurus is like, wow, we really definitely got to revisit that now. <laughs> we should revisit that one. Yeah. But again, we, we talked about it being a swimmer in the episode. So yeah. um, we've been encouraging people, if you want to know more about the evolutionary history of Spinosaurus and the discovery, check out our episode. But just know, <laughs> we've got a tail now. <laughs> <laughs> that shows that it swam which makes total sense i think i was in that in that group of yeah spinosaurus was aquatic for quite some time now um so i'm glad that i've i've been supported in my hypothesis <laughs> that must be one of the most exciting parts about the show though or making the show is that the stories are just constantly changing and um like new stuff comes out and things change and like it just probably gives you one job security, but also the <laughs> <laughs> like just the ability to tell so many amazing stories. That must just be the best part about all of this. Would you say that? Yeah. Oh, I I I love that part of it. Um, I and it, it's funny because I've been in paleontology for a while now, and every once in a while we'll get a script, and I'm like, what? 
I had no idea. Like, oh, how yeah. did I not know this? And so um, just my general knowledge of the ancient past has increased a lot since I started working on eons. That's been me and Brittany. Part of it. Yeah, that's been me and Brittany when we do these Fossil Friday chats. Like, every episode I learn something new. I'm like, what? Oh, <laughs> man, that's awesome. And you think you've heard everything, right? That's definitely my favorite part, too. Um, working with writers who have training and backgrounds in certain disciplines, and then they'll pitch us on something. The latest example is um, we did an episode called When the Medi that, time, that Time the Mediterranean Disappeared about the Mycenaean salinity crisis. And like there was no, the Mediterranean Sea just kind of like shrunk and animals started migrating around and then they got isolated again. And there was like gigantism and dwarfism after they became isolated in these islands. And I'm like, what now? <laughs> like say that again, slowly, like I'm an English major, which I am. And I was just amazed that the whole thing happened. Like those, one of my favorite episodes are like those specific events in geologic time that most people don't even know existed or like the corneal pluvial uh, corneal mm -hmm. pluvial episode yeah mountain's a, a great performer for us too because i think there's a lot of people think that we're talking about the biblical floods <laughs> yeah <laughs> thanks for the watch thanks yeah. for the view um it is thanks. rain and rain and rain yeah and i think we get the most positive comments from our geological based episodes. Um, people just completely blown away. They had no idea that this existed, that this happened in the ancient past. I think a lot of people are familiar with T-Rex. They're like, yeah, giant dinosaur, tiny little arms, lots of teeth, you know? But then you talk about like the great unconformity in the Grand Canyon. And most people are familiar with the Grand Canyon, but they might not be familiar that over a billion years worth of rock is just missing, you know? So. Um, we get a lot of really great feedback from those geo-based episodes, for sure. Actually, I think that dinosaur episodes tend to be, like, have the lowest traffic. Yeah. And there's other things that people have not heard of that get the most response. Mm -hmm. I've sometimes heard paleontology described um, as a gateway drug in terms of science, and that it's a very accessible, um, very charismatic uh, mm -hmm. scientific subject when it comes to, like, community. Um, <laughs> So um, I know I personally, you know, I'd always been interested in paleontology since I was a kid, but it was once I started getting paleontological training, I really developed an appreciation for geology in particular, because, you know, I, I just look at something and think, it's a rock, but it's so much more than that. And it has its own story and it's made uh, driving from uh, California to Phoenix. And if anybody's familiar with that drive um, prior to becoming a paleontologist, I thought it was rather dry. And now I think it's an incredibly interesting drive because I can look at the rocks and be like, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. A gateway science is true. Shall yeah. we take some questions? Yeah. We've got a lot of good ones. Um, oh, good. So, this. so um, this is from Ada. Um, they're asking um, a two-part question. So the first part is, um, what is your advice on pursuing a career on paleontology besides volunteering? And on top of that, uh, how can they get involved in science communication as a high school student? Ooh, oh, good wow. questions. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for the first part of that question, besides volunteering, you can also join rock and mineral clubs, paleo clubs, um, reach out to people on social media. A lot of paleontologists are on social media now, whether it be Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Yep, yep, everybody. Everybody's on uh, social media now. So you can reach out to them. As far as academia goes, um, you really need to focus in geology and biology. So I always say that paleontology is a marriage between two fields, biology and geology. You need to understand the rocks to be able to find the fossils and you need to understand biology to understand the fossils. And so uh, absorb everything you can about biology, about geology, take field trips, go rock collecting, try to ID things. Um, as, as much of that as you can. And then when you get into college, um, try to go to a school that probably has a museum attached to it. So like the ALF or the Western Science Center or the Museum of the Rockies, you know, because that'll give you somewhere to work and practice your skills immediately. Um, so in my undergrad, we had a geology museum and I was the assistant curator of it. And so that was definitely my gateway into the field. 
Um, and also know there's a ton of different ways to be a paleontologist than just a PhD professor. Um, so you could be like me and work behind the scenes as a collections manager. Collections manager. Woo, woo. <laughs> We're the best. We're it's the best, true. by the way. Sorry. Um, we are the gatekeepers to all of science, basically. So you got to be nice to them, yeah. Oh, I'm yeah, adding that to my CV, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can you can work behind the scenes. Uh, there's a whole like if you don't like to get your hands dirty, there's a ton of modeling and computer based work that can be done without ever stepping foot in the dusty, hot, sunny desert where you find fossils. And so there are billions of specimens waiting to be discovered in museum collections around the world. So you could literally just make a life of traveling all over the world to different museums and taking measurements of bones and then mm -hmm. writing a paper. Um, you can also work for state and federal governments. And so most states have a paleontology program or at least a state paleontologist, state geologist. So you could work that way. You could work in the private sector. Um, there's a lot of different ways to work in paleontology for sure. Yeah. And when it comes to science communication, um, like literally anyone can do it because I do <laughs> and did. <laughs> and like, I'm not a scientist, you know, and that's sort of what's part of interesting about the dynamic between Callie and me is like, I'm sort of a professional question asker. I know enough about the field to I, I, like, 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 and informed questions, but, and also to understand the answers. But like my, my, my so what you have, question asker, is what everyone has, which is your curiosity and your voice. And you have the whole internet to develop those two things. And it's, the internet is free real estate. So I would encourage you to think about like starting a blog about whatever sort of niche of paleontology that you're interested in. And you don't have to like break news, but you can just sort of like translate for your readers what the Spinosaurus discovery really means, what the significance of it is. And like, mm -hmm. what do you think about it, you know? Um, if there are some things where there, if there's a um, media coverage around something, say that's like an ongoing debate, say like snake evolution, you can use your blog to weigh in on it. It doesn't have to be a blog though. I mean, back in the day when Tumblr was a thing, there was a ton of paleo Tumblr. Uh, mm -hmm. There are paleo tweeters. Uh, there's a lot of people on Instagram, have a great, including Callie Moore, have a great Insta game. Like Instagram <laughs> is a great place to translate in sort of bite-sized portions um, the significance of something for people who ordinarily wouldn't understand it or not understand it, but wouldn't appreciate it, you know? And it might not even come across their feed unless um, you had posted about it, you know, and then it sort of takes off. So I, I'd say social media is your friend. You can blog for free and just use uh, these years to pursue your curiosity and develop your voice. Definitely. One thing that's fun to mention, too, is um, you don't have to have started in it. You can change later, too. Yeah. Um, it's funny, the parallel here, because Brittany started as a journalism major, right? And now she's paleo. I have a, I have a degree in English. And Woo! Yeah. We should start a support group together. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It turns out I already spoke that language. Yeah. And then I decided to get a degree in it. <laughs> Well, and then, but like for me and Callie, we started in the sciences, but we've kind of shifted to more educational stuff. Mm -hmm. And so like it, the parallel here is funny, but also it's like we started one path and it diverged and it goes different places. So just follow what you feel like you want to do most and you'll find it. Like I didn't start mm -hmm. paleontology until I was 24, 23 maybe. So. Yeah. And it's okay if it changes. Um, and totally. I think any career um you're what you want and how you want to pursue it is going to change as you get older and that's okay um but but yeah uh i started out uh in a completely different field and decided to uh get into paleontology and so if i can do it so can you <laughs> yep i actually started out as a science uh secondary education major i was going to be a high school biology teacher and i was like one one year in and i was like mm. No, nope, no, nope. I, I had to take a physical sciences course. And within the first week of that class, I was like, oh, I'm done. Change my <laughs> and that was the end of that. And so even, Relatable. Me, even me changed my major almost instantly. Yeah. 
Awesome. All right. Here's another good question. Uh, this is probably for Callie. Uh, this is from Ines, who's from Germany. So we have some far flung uh, <gasps> today. Awesome. How do you decide or know what color the skin of a dinosaur has? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, a lot of times we don't. We don't know. And we just make a best guess. It's a artistic interpretation. Uh, if they have feathers, that's that's real good. That's real good if they have feathers. So feathers can preserve melanosomes and melanosomes preserve coloration. So there are several feather dinosaurs out there that we have coloration for. Um, there's even uh, Cetacosaurus. Cetacosaurus. Um, it's a relative of like Triceratops, I think. I think. And it was found with some like weird little quill things. And I think they did find um, the underbelly. And so they could tell that it was countershaded. Um, and I think that's the only one that I know of that wasn't just feather based of how, how, what color the dinosaurs were or anything in ancient life. That's probably one of the most infuriating things about <laughs> paleontology. <laughs> look like um, is really hard because you, you just look at the beautiful diversity of life right now and all the colors and the shapes and the sizes and um, and then you go back in the fossil record and you know it had to be that diverse it had to be that beautiful but we'll probably never know um, unless some really cool new techniques come out and some way better preserved fossils um, are found but yeah unfortunately just bust out your crayons and pick your favorite colors. <laughs> I covered a dinosaur dig in eastern North Dakota, and a paleontologist who was leading the dig actually had some hypotheses about these. And I haven't heard anyone else or, uh, sort of repeat this or reinforce it, but it was a uh, dig of a demontosaurus, which is like there are a dime a dozen out there. And there are so, so many demontosaurus remains in Hell Creek Formation that like most of the time they don't bother to excavate them. But they did this specimen because it was really well articulated. It was all sort of together. And it was surrounded on one side by skin impressions. And he, his hypothesis was he wanted to use, I, don't, I shouldn't follow up to see if he ever um, did any research on this because it was years ago. He wanted to use modern proxies of reptiles to compare um, the size and shape of the scales and see if that could tell us anything about color. Ooh. And he said there tend to be, in, in modern reptiles, there tend to be uh, certain correlations between size and the shape of the tail. And remember this monosaurus was generally hexagonal and so that like gave him a sort of uh an, an origin point a, a place to start looking uh, but i don't know if you ever followed up on that but that's the only uh, other um kind of proxy i've heard of for estimating what or guessing what a, a color dinosaur was i think gabe i think we might need to do a paleo art episode in the future mm. oh okay I'll put that in our awesome. schedule because now I've got ideas. Uh -huh. <laughs> That'll be awesome. We know people. Know. We know people. Yeah. We can we can set you up. <laughs> All right. Here's a question from Diana. This one's just fun. Is your studio haunted? <laughs> I've heard My rumors. Kids... <laughs> I, I have two kids, and when we first moved into the funeral home, which I feels like two years ago. Yeah. Because we shot, we started chewing eons there. Um, yeah. So it probably is just. Yeah, like maybe two and a half, three years ago. And my yeah, kids I asked me my, if it was... I did my got... screen tests at the old place. Oh, wow. Okay. But I we started filming at the new place. So it had to be right right in the 2016-2017. And my kids were like, you know, eight and five or something at the time. And said, so is this place haunted? I'm walking through the studios. And like their father's a man of science. And like, no, because no one died here. The dead people were just kept here. <laughs> <laughs> that did not like allay their fears at all <laughs> i have to say though that the tile from the embalming room is absolutely gorgeous and complexly kept it and that's now the bathroom floor so they split the embalming room into two bathrooms yeah and, but the tile is just oh it's that beautiful old hexagonal tile <sighs> oh it's just great but yeah that was the embalming room that's awesome <laughs> honestly that is so cool i want to see it one day and my office is in the garage where they used to park the hearses. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> All righty. Here's a, uh, a good question. What's your, what was your favorite creature to talk about on the show? Oh. <laughs> I 
feel like I've asked a very short but very complex question. It's like the what's your favorite dinosaur question? Um, yeah. Paraceralophus. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, another another uh, organism that we need to revisit now is Tully monster. And it's one of the first scripts that we shot. And I wrote that script because I was fascinated by the fact that at the time, like there was no, it was just this problematica. Like there was, they, they couldn't assign it to any taxa. And I was fascinated by that. And when you see like renderings of it, it's like, what? Like, it's like, I think the way I put it in the script is like, um, like a Star Wars character, right? Yes. Like if, uh, an Imagineer from Star Wars ate a pepperoni pizza and then drank a whole thing of you you who and went to bed and had a nightmare. They would dream up that animal. <laughs> and then <laughs> it would be in the Naboo like trenches. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly. Thank you. Um, I'm interested. Yeah, I'm interested in the the really surprising counterintuitive things in natural history that just yeah just like take you by surprise and that we can't really explain well, but we're trying to figure out. Like I'm interested in those sort of unsolved mysteries. Yeah, and for me, um, I love ancient animals. I'm not so much, um, this is the most I've learned about human evolution. Like, I know kind of the gist of it, but I never really studied it. And that's not what I, that's, you know, that's anthropologist. That's, you know, that's not me. Uh, so for eons, it's actually been really great to have all of these paleoanthropologists episodes nothing about them and um probably my favorite one of those was your your place in the primate family tree i oh, yeah. oh, i love that episode is so good it, it walks you through you know you start out at purgatorius and you go to here and you go through here and then all of a sudden you're a human you know and so um that's probably one of my favorite episodes and and i usually tend to be like huh the most with our anthropology scripts nice we use that one sometimes in our uh, summer program. We show that to our students. Yes. Oh, awesome. awesome. That's good to know. Yeah. You guys are well known amongst the junior junior scholars at the ALF Museum. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> I want to join you in one of your uh, digs. You have digs out on Barstow, don't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, come by. You're more than welcome. That would be awesome. Oh, I love mammals. <laughs> Field episode? Field episode? I'm just saying. Ah. Alrighty. All right. Here is another question. This is from Jim. Are there any topics in the works that you're excited about? Oh, gosh. Um, we just shot, I don't want to get into details. We just shot an episode uh, about viruses that humans have had for millions of years. And that's all I'm going to say. But... It was a long time in development and it's very, very interesting. And it's just sort of a reminder of like, uh, we've been through this millions of times, you know, and we're still here. Let's see, for me, I don't really, um, since I, I see episodes once they're like ready to go, I don't get into our program that runs all like the ideas of all the things, but there's this one that I keep seeing every once in a while I get into this program called Trello and that's how we organize all of our episodes and ideas. And there's this one tile that says, why the hippopotamus didn't poop itself to death. <laughs> and I want to know, <laughs> I want to know. And it's still in like the pending phase and I don't know why, I don't know any background about when that episode is going to come out and i don't know i i'm assuming it's about hippos but what what so that's probably one that i'm the most curious about right now is why the hippo didn't poop itself to death <laughs> i'm very curious myself i i'm gonna request that that episode be sent to us for review early <laughs> <laughs> i'll see what i can do <laughs> And I can tell you it has to do with uh, audiodactyls and their digestive systems and why they need a lot, a lot, a lot of water. Ooh. Interesting. And how that has affected their evolutionary arc. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a lot of questions here. So um, we're probably not going to be able to get all to all of them in the time. You guys are pretty popular today. Yay! <laughs> 
we'll make an effort to answer them after uh, this stream ends. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so we will do our best, everyone. So I know everybody had lots of good questions and lots of compliments on the show, um, I just want to point out. So you guys have made a difference and an impact with your show. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. It's so good to know. It's really a labor of love. Well, it's definitely even for me and Brittany. I mean, we were talking about it before we even met you. And when we were just starting in our careers and we'd like talk about, did you see that eons? And it's like, yeah, that's kind of like what we want to do when we grow up. Right. And then like <laughs> after we met you, it was just like, are we, are we sitting with Blake? And then it just grew into this thing now. And like, it's awesome to talk with you guys about science communication and YouTube and things like that, because it's such a collaborative effort for all of us to work and build all these great resources for people. And it's, you guys are really doing some great things to inspire more science communicators, but to do it effectively is the best part. And to echo um, Kelly's point from earlier, you don't need like a complex, you don't need a team, you don't need a production company uh, to have an impact, especially in this space. And I was kind of fanboying when I met YouTube because I knew YouTube from social media and like you're, you know, a generation ahead of me in terms of capitalizing on social media to do science communication. And I was like, I know Gabe and Brittany. I don't actually, I've met them. Um, and okay. so I'm gonna need like a minute. The... <laughs> um, just like the the viewer who asked about like how can I pursue science communication? Like really, you just need your curiosity on your yeah. voice. And don't need many resources. I think you just need those things. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Blake and Callie, for joining us again. I think this is a really fun episode. And thank you all um, in the chat and whoever's watching for joining us. I know we had um, some pretty, uh, so we have international viewers this time. So it was very cool to see all of you and get to share this with you. So thank you, everybody, on behalf of the Western Science Center and the Alp Museum. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And thank you, Blake and Callie. Thanks yeah. so much for having us. Yeah, yeah thanks for having us. Just a reminder, everybody, we will have Fossil Friday web chats next week, so join us then. And if you wish, there will be information on how you can support the programs of both of our museums so we can continue bringing you content like this. So thank you and have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>